watching Kenosha Community Television. notes. Um, first of all, I need to know how many of you are here because of our G fans. Regularly follow them. Okay, a couple of groupies in the audience. Thank you. Um, how about regular PMNLers? The regular attend our show. Awesome. And the rest of you must be new? Yeah. That's great. We really appreciate it. In your program, you must have so seen we got a new show coming up in just a couple weeks. So uh, be, sure to, be sure to come out and check the musical The Spitfire Grill. Um, we are a not-for-profit community theater, and we own this building. So to some people, that's a blessing. But to the board of directors, it's like a curse, right? <laughs> uh, we want to thank everybody who has contributed to our Grand Curtain Fund. We um, ended up uh, taking down the curtain. It needed repair. It needed to be um, fireproofed. We didn't need it on stage. Our sets were coming out pretty far. So we thought, let's take it down, get that stuff done. It came back. We still didn't need to put it up yet. We put it up in the loft in the one area where we had never gotten water. Oh. And guess what? Remember those spring rains uh, last year? Yeah. So we now have a brand new grand curtain, totally motorized, gives us more space along the wall. We are losing a couple seats, but we're going to work that out. we got a plan for that. So um, we totally... Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea that RG is. All their proceeds are going right to our Grand Curtain Fund. So thank you, RG. You will be able to see the curtain working in Censored on Final Approach. The uh, Spitfire Grill set is coming all the way out here. So um, keep that in mind. Come back for the next two shows. See the curtain not working and the curtain working. <laughs> Um, there, uh, just to let you know, there's the bathroom up in the corner. Um, uh, good old Ken got it fixed, so it is working again. All right. Otherwise, there are bathrooms downstairs. The show runs about two hours. Halfway through, there will be an intermission. We have cookies and coffee and punch downstairs. Emergency exits, two here by the side door, out in the front, these people in the balcony. Jump, you know, <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> We'll fly you down, right? <laughs> And then before I will give you the, the, the stage to meet up, just want to let you know that we do have auditions coming up on March 9th and 10th here at the theater for Censored on Final Approach. Um, and you can find out all the details on that on our website, pmltheater.com. We are a community theater with open auditions, so please do come on out and try it. Um, with that being said, again, thank you so much for this full house. Love you all. And Nita and RG Productions with Radio Noir. Hi, good afternoon. Kathy, thank you so much for that wonderful welcome. It's great to see everybody here today. Um, we're delighted to be here. We've got a great Radio Noir lineup for you today. For those of you who aren't familiar with our group, we have been performing old time radio recreations complete with music. Hello to the Together Again duo. <laughs> Live sound effects and original scripts from the 1930s and 40s. We have a great lineup for you today. We'll present two acts. The first act is going to be a Sam Spade caper. And then after a brief song or two, we'll have Night Beat, which actually originated in Chicago. And we're very excited about doing those two shows. And then after a brief intermission, where you can go downstairs and have something to drink and a light snack, you'll come back up. And we have some stories that were written by local authors. The first one is Rebecca Diamond, Private Eye. And she is a character that I actually created several years ago after performing on stages for so long, you kind of get the desire to write one of your own. Uh, and she's a tough talk in Private Eye, and she's a female. And so after doing things like Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe, uh, we're really excited to present to you a really tough female Private Eye. 
And then right here in our audience, we have another local actor, Rich Bell. Where are you, Rich? Thank you, all the way in the back. Uh, Rich has written a very uh, delightful spoof on Dragnet, which we have really enjoyed rehearsing, and we look forward to presenting that to you. Uh, a couple things of note, today's show is actually being recorded both on video and audio, and there are places that you can hear the show or watch the show after it's over. So we'd first of all like to thank Jason Rimkis from Kenosha Community Media for being here today to film the show. And our own sound engineer, Rick Haggerty, actually prepares the audio to run on several different radio stations. And you can find that information in the program brochure where you can listen to those on demand, watch them on demand or on cable uh, in the Kenosha area. So we're very excited about that. And then finally, our next show is coming up on May 17th. And again, there's a little blurb in the, um, in the program. We are delightfully honored to actually be performing as part of the Todd Theater Festival not far away in Woodstock on May 17th. It just gives me chills just to say this, but as being an old time radio performance recreation company, we are so inspired by Orson Welles, who was born in Kenosha, but spent his childhood at the Todd School for Boys in Woodstock. And we have been asked to perform an Orson Welles tribute, tribute on the very stage where he made his stage debut. So we're really excited and we hope we'll jo you'll join us for the, for the festival and then for the actual performance, which is at 8 o'clock at night on May 17th. Now, all of the characters and all of the title characters in today's show share a resilience and a determination both to solve their capers and on and off, um, excuse me, both to solve their capers and their crimes, but also they have to come, um, overcome adverse things in their own personal lives as well. One of our actors with RG Productions is undergoing some life tributes right now, which require resilience, and we dedicate our show to Suzanne Wilczek today, and we hope that our performance raises her up. Enjoy the show. probably wondering how this good-looking guy got stuck working in a dump like this. <laughs> well, some people get to pick their professions, and others, their professions pick them. Like me. We have stale coffee, old cigars, cheap whiskey, and dames. Cases weren't half bad either. But that's my story. That's a different story. Not one you've come to hear today. Dames and whiskey. Reminds me of a private dick I once knew. Friday, Stone Spade, Joe, no, Sam Spade, that's it. Perhaps a review of my files will refresh my memory. Like jazz, the hard-boiled private detective is entirely an American invention that was given life in the pages of pulp magazines. The most famous of these magazines being Black Mask. To understand the adventures of Sam Spade, it's helpful to understand crime fighters in the pulps. One of the elements that made the detective magazine so popular was the heroic figures in the center of the action. Nice hat. 
The private detective, known as the private dick, was the idealization of the lone individual representing justice and decency pitted against gangs, corruptions, and agencies who violated that sense of goodness with which most readers identified. They always remained victorious in spite of the most hopeless odds against them. Today's Sam Spade caper is based on the private detective character by Dashiell Hammett and beloved by filmgoers in the 1930 crime classic, The Maltese Falcon. That's the stuff us dreams are made of, sweetheart. By 1942, Sam Spade, played by Howard Duff, was the most striking detective on the air. After a few un-American references about anti-communist lawmakers, the show sponsored Wild Root Cream Oil forced Dashiell Hammett's name from the credits and the removal of Howard Duff from the show in September of 1950. Duff was replaced by a very unpopular, boyish-sounding Steve Dunn. The adventures of Sam Spade followed a formula that radio listeners enjoyed every Sunday evening on CBS radio for several years during the 40s. First thing Spade wanted to know was, how much you got on you? 200. Okay, I'll take that. Pay me the rest later. Spade was not in the business for his health, but Spade wasn't a spendthrift. His favorite mode of transportation was the streetcar, which took him anywhere for a dime. He had an aversion to cabs and a liking for cheap booze. Each show opened with the story being dictated to Effie Perrine, who was always flustered and secretly in love with him. Each case unfolded as a report, a caper if you will, dated with the actual air date, signed and delivered to the client, the client's widow or the police. The show was loved in its time and it still had a style and class that all other radio shows envied. Ladies and gentlemen, RG Production brings you The Adventures of Sam Spade. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. It's me, sweetheart. You ever heard of pulling a rabbit out of a hat? Yeah. Well, I pulled one out of a pickle. Hey, what happened, Sam? What happened, she asks. Well, don't you feel like talking about it? Frankly, no, but it's expected of me. So, sharpen a carrot, buy me some rabbit punch. <laughs> what? Get the hutch ready, because I'm about to hippity hop through the door with the lowdown on the flopsy, mopsy, and cottontail caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, Hard Boiled Private Eye, and Michael J. Smith, radio's renowned director of mystery and fine drama, combine their talents to make your hair stand on end with The Adventures of Sam Spade, presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the Hair. And now, Ed Godula, starring as the title character, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in... The Adventures of Sam Spade. Effie! Oh, uh, here I am, Sam. Now, what's the meaning of this? Of what? My desk and my chair are shoved over to one side of the office. What well, to make room for the other desk in the bookcase? There'll be no other desk and no other bookcase and no anything else. But, Sam... Now, I don't say it. Don't even think about that man. You understand? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I spoke harshly. Now, I'm sorry, but the past hours have taken a toll on my nerves. Perhaps I should unburden myself. We'd all feel better. All right, sir. Unboyben yourself? What? Now, nah, never mind that. Just zip the lip and sharpen the pencil tip. All right. <clears throat> to Mrs. Wellington Van Cleve Montague, Knob Hill, or else... From Samuel Spade, license number 13576, subject, The Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail Caper, or How Fritz Crockett Saved the Day. My dear, dear Mrs. Montague. It all began Thursday afternoon when I entered my office and discovered a dark-haired, wild young man sitting in my chair with his feet up on my desk and sampling my office bottle. The pose was so familiar for a minute, I thought it was me. Hello, Sam. I'll be with you in a minute. Have a seat. Thanks. I will. The one you're sitting in. You see, the detective sits in that seat and the client sits over there. Oh, qualifies me for this seat then. I'm a detective. I see. Well, uh, the detective we like in this office is Sam Spade, see? He pays the rent, he hires the secretary, he earns the money, 
and he sits behind his desk. So take a hike. Okay, okay. But with two detectives around here and only one detective chair, it's gonna get a little crowded. You mind if I have a drink out of my glass? Oh, sure, sure. You know, we better make a note to get another glass, too. Um... And get some scotch. I don't care much for that bourbon. No self-respecting detective drinks scotch. Oh, and put this down. We'll need another desk and a yeah, new paint job on these walls. Oh? Oh, yeah. Something, something bright. Uh, robin's egg blue, perhaps. Soothes the nervous client. And a bookshelf. You got that, Effie? Or am I going too fast? I think I got it. All done, Fritz. Desk, paint, bookshelf, scotch. A toot, Effie. Ah, uh, she's a doll. Now, wait a minute. That's my line. <laughs> After I work with you a while, Sam, you'll appreciate me. So long. I'm great. Bye. You need me. Why? Because we beat an unbeatable team. With my talent and your luck, <laughs> it would be a sure thing. Luck? Ever heard of Fritz Crockett? Chicago Fritz Crockett? Yes. Never heard of him. Ah, Sam. Look, you're making your mark here in your hometown. Now, why do you want to come work for me in San Francisco? Well, I, I lost my license in Chicago. Got caught on the hot side of a political battle. Worked for the losers, and the winners framed me for my license. Oh, gee, that's tough, kid. I can't get a license in any state until I clear that mess up. And so I have to work under somebody else's. Yeah, but why me? Because I've kept an eye on you, Sam. I like the way you're developing. I think you could work well with me. Gee, well, thanks. Your application's received. Give me a couple of years to think it over. What's the matter, Sam? Afraid I might touch your reputation in town? Yeah, found me out. But anyway, bye. Chicken, huh? Look, you want to compare scrapbooks sometime? A really good detective's got to be an actor. I play any style. Listen, listen, I have a job for us. Yeah, well, so... Job? Where? <laughs> Yesterday, Sam, I met an old friend from Chicago. She remembered me from an important cocktail party. Saved it for th the party. Everyone was absolutely bleary until I became de rigueur with a brace of amusing anecdotes. Yeah, the job, Fritz, the job. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she wants us to guard a valuable hunk of jewelry at a party tonight on Knob Hill. Yeah, what's the money? A hundred apiece. Plus, mingling with top-notch dancers and all the caviar we can eat. Well, well then, that's better than I expected. In fact... Now, I... now, here's what I want you to do. Oh, wait a minute. What's with this here what I want you to do? This is the Sam Spade Detective Agency. Named so because Sam Spade's the man who gives the orders around here. Now, what do you want me to do? Well, this is a costume party, and we have to wear costumes. It's in the deal. Good, I'll break your leg, and you can go as the man who came to dinner. Sam, I already have the costumes. What? Right here. Crockett, what would you have done if I didn't go with you? <laughs> that thought never entered my head, Sam. All right, what are the costumes? Uh, Sam, 100 clams apiece is a lot of dough. Agreed. You are about to confront the reason we are getting paid so much. What is... That. Your costume. You are to go as a rabbit. A white rabbit. Here's the suit. Oh, here, here's the head. Notice the shocking pink ears? Uh, no. The deal's off. It's been swell. Now, but... wait a minute. I am also going as a rabbit. See, you will be Flopsy, and I will go as Mopsy. I will not go anywhere dressed in this ridiculous outfit. One hundred dollars, Sam. I will... Well... Sam, let's talk this over. Now look, I will talk to you as a businessman might talk to you. <clears throat> oh, now, Mr. Spade, you uh, take your ordinary type detective and you have a pretty spotty character on your hands with that. We talked and talked, and around 8 o'clock that night, I found myself still talking and walking up the steps of your Knob Hill mansion, Mrs. Montague, cleverly disguised as Flopsy the Rabbit and Paw and Paw with Mopsy Crockett. My headpiece covered everything but my eyes, nose, and mouth, and I was grateful for that. When we passed the doorman, I was tempted to say, 
Eh, what's up, Doc? But uh, Fritz said it ahead of me. We walked in as if this was his personal hutch, and you, Mrs. Montague, cruised on over to us. Well, my little bunny twins, aren't you both so darling? Yeah. Which one of you is Mr. Spade? Oh, well, well, I'm Mr. Crockett, Mrs. Montague, uh, Mopsy. You remember me from being at that soiree with uh, Ronnie and Benita? Or maybe it was Gypsy introduced us, Nespa? Oh, yes. Well, I'm glad you were able to be here, Mr. Spade. I've always wanted to meet you. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Montague. I'm the straight man. How do you like my costume? Well... There is not another one like it in town. Yeah. I'm the only wood nymph in San Francisco. The trees will swoon, they will. Oh, you... Uh, uh, Mrs. Montague, perhaps you'd be disposed to outline our job? Well, of course, Mr. Uh, uh, Crockett. <laughs> Uh, myself, uh, Mrs. Arlington Clifford McGill, and the famous Spanish artist Julio Noriega are going to pick the woman with the most fascinating costume. I'll search no further. It could be no one but you. Oh, flatterer. <laughs> I'm not eligible. Oh. Then at 10 o'clock, we'll have a grand parade. The winner will lead the parade wearing a small jewel-studded crown. Oh, darling, thousands of emeralds and all sorts of things. Well, this crown once belonged to Josephine of France. Imagine. Uh, Mrs. Montague, I hate to be an old killjoy, but we are here to uh, guard the crown. Oh, that's right, Blopsy. I think this is best. Well, how's that? Well, of course, I don't expect any trouble, but it is so valuable, I can't take any chances. My husband picked it up in Iran. He's in pickles, you know. Well, you know best. Hey, uh, where is the crown now, Mrs. Montague? Oh, in the vault. The safe is in the master bedroom on the second floor. Here's the combination to the safe written down. Uh, no, I'd uh, rather not have the combination, if you don't mind, until it's time to get the crown. Oh, what? Don't you be silly, Mr. Spade. Next to the crown, there's only fifty or $60,000 in the safe. Oh, well, if that's all. And the safe is behind the Degas original. Now, until I need you, just go and enjoy yourselves. Oh, well, we're going. Maybe I'll even let you dance a little with me. Woo-hoo! Woo! Fritz and I synchronized our watches and decided that until we were needed, we would lose ourselves in the crowd and keep our big rabbit ears open. Everybody was masked and loaded and it was all very tame. I brushed elbows with pirates, a gorilla, an Arabian princess, and assorted but historic characters. I was dipping a carrot into the punch bowl when a girl made her way over to me. I knew it was girl immediately. You could tell. I uh, tagged her as a burlesque queen, but she sure didn't talk much like one. Are you a he bunny or a she bunny? Uh, I'm a he bunny. Hmm. Would you like to dance with me? Oh, I'd be delighted. Uh, who are you? Uh, well, I'm not supposed to tell until the mask comes off. For now, you can just call me Flopsy. Flopsy, how cute. You Americans have the cutest ideas. Yeah, speaking of ideas, uh, what do you represent? <coughs> oh, I'm a fully beger dancer. Do you like me? Well... From where I stand, it'd be next to impossible to dislike you. Oh, that is possible. Oh, the lady was a beaut. So tell me, have you been in the country long? Well, a few weeks. My, my family has sent me on a tour of America. I see. Mm. I am a guest here of Monsieur Montague. Now tell me, you're a detective, aren't you? Now, as much as I regretted doing it, I hastily detached myself from Miss Folly Berger in 1949. How she knew I was a detective puzzled me. And I saw Crockett talking with a paunchy red devil and a middle-aged Christopher Columbus who stopped by. And they were big businessmen, obviously, and <laughs> so was he. Well, uh, now you take your ordinary paper freak today, uh, someone you meet in a place like, well, well, say like I'm in Chicago on the Lower East Side, and they say, oh. Would have been impossible to interrupt him, so I moved on. Finally, I sat down to rest in a quiet corner of the library, and I no sooner did than a large green pickle with two bandy legs sticking out of it 
sat down beside me. Uh, want a bite of my pickle? No, thanks. Go ahead. It's free. Yeah, well, I only eat carrots. Thank you just the same. Uh, I suppose you know who I am. Matter of fact, I don't know. Well, I shouldn't tell you, but I'm lonesome for somebody to talk to. Well, I, uh... My wife's dancing with another man. Sometimes I think she only likes me for my money. Find that hard to believe. Well, I have millions, you know, millions. I'm Horace Montague, the Pickle King. I've sold more pickles than any living man. Congratulations. You like my costume. Never smelled anything like it. <laughs> when I came to this town, it was just an ordinary new pickle. Sometimes I come as a dill, sometimes I come as a gherkin. How about that? <laughs> Once I came as a sweet-sour mixture. Yeah? I got very confused. Well, it's up to you. I guess all I really have is my money. I'm kind of tired of being so rich. It was fun in the early days. I was a pioneer, you know. Started, I suppose, with just a wart. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Very funny. Yeah, well, keep laughing, Horace. I have to be hopping along. Thank you for talking with me. I was beginning to feel like an extra in Alice in Wonderland. I headed back for the solace of the punch bowl. I saw Mopsy Crockett standing with the Follies Bajer dancer and went over to him. But he suddenly turned and hopped away faster than I could hop after him. With the coyness, I couldn't understand. When I finally caught up with him ten minutes later, he was waltzing with Anne of Austria, who was hanging on his every word. And that was a lot of hanging. Mein darling, until you have tasted mein Liebchen, Kutchen, you have the stories of Goethe, Schiller, Heimler, all mashed und von Goulash. Eh, uh, you mind if I cut in? If you must. I mean with the other rabbit. Come along, Mopsy. Well, of all the cheek. Excuse me, darling. I come later back. Hello, Sam. Uh, what do you hear from the mob? Oh, it's the idea of avoiding me. Oh, avoiding you? <laughs> no, I, I don't know what you mean. Yeah, you do, Crockett. Don't you remember ten minutes ago, am I chasing you all over the floor? So help me, I don't. Oh, there you are, my little bunnies. Yeah, here we are, Mrs. Montague. All right, you can give me the crown now. I'm almost ready to announce the winner of the costumes. Uh, well, we haven't taken it out yet, Mrs. Montague. You haven't? You just said you were going to get it. Well, I didn't. Jufritz? Not I, Flopsy. Now, bunnies, you stop playing jokes. One of you came up to me a couple of minutes ago and said you'd lost the combination to the safe, so I gave it to you again. You said you were going to get the crown. Now, where is it? Well, I don't know, but let's find it. <laughs> When we arrived in the master bedroom, the worst had happened. The Degas original was gone off the wall. The safe was open. And believe it or not, the fifty or sixty thousand dollars habitually kept in it wasn't even touched. But you, Mrs. Montague, weren't worried about the cash. Oh, it's not here! The Josephine crown is gone! Oh, this is frightful. What will Horace say? Uh, well, we're sorry, Mrs. Montague. Sorry? You were supposed to guard it. It's your fault. Maybe you stole it yourself. Mrs. Montague, we did nothing of the kind. I distinctly remember you saying you were going to get it, and I did give you the combination again, and I know you did it. Oh, Horace! Horace, what happened, Hobby dear? Well, I was walking down the hall when a, a rabbit came running out. Drag me into a room, made me take off my pickle. Oh. Oh. <laughs> he, he hit me in the head with something. Then he took off his bunny suit, jumped into my pickle, and ran off. Oh, my head. Oh. Crockett and I dashed down the hall to the room where the pickle king had abdicated. On the floor, there was a limp, unfilled costume of a rabbit. The Montague's party not only had a flopsy and a mopsy, but it also had a thieving cottontail. I left Fritz Crockett and Mrs. M attending to Horace in the master bedroom and bounded down the stairs, through the guest and out the front door. I was standing there wondering whether to pick up the trail of the rabbit turned pickle when I saw the Folly Berger dancer come running out of the uh, Montague mansion through a side entrance and enter a taxi. I jumped into another cab and followed her, divesting myself of my flopsy costume en route. She went to the west end of O'Farrell Street, entered a shabby gray apartment house. I followed. I knocked on every door until I found hers. We? Oui? Hey, it's me, the he-bunny. Mm. Flopsy, remember? 
Why did you follow me here? Voila, because you're so beautiful. Can I come in? No. Thanks. I said no. Do you not hear me? Yeah, but have no fear. I'm bonded. So, how did you know there was a detective? Uh, detective's heart beating under this rabbit suit. I am not going to answer. You have no right to come here. Come on, how? Uh, I think I overheard someone say it. Now, if that is all you wanted, no, please go. Why'd you leave the party early? Because it bored me. I thought America was not a police state. Why am I being questioned? Because somebody sold the Josephine crown that belonged to Mrs. Montague. Uh, I'm glad it's stolen. I am delighted. But I did not steal it. Hmm. What's your name? Charmaine Roger. What's yours? Sam Spade. Now, why are we so happy that the crown was stolen? Because it does not belong in the ugly home of a childish woman who thinks only of her social position and her money. Oh? We only take what is ours, not money. Now, where does it belong? In France, where it was made and where it will be appreciated. Oh, I see. How much is it worth? In money, 150 to 200 million francs. It is more than one can say. You're saying that crown means more to a Frenchman than money? <laughs> well, how would you like it if your Abraham Lincoln desk was being used by some businessman to serve cocktails over? Hmm, you get the point. <sighs> I'll tell you again, I do not know what happened to the Josephine crown tonight. Do you believe me? Well, I did, but only because when she left the party, she wore only her costume, and that costume wouldn't have hidden... Well, let's say she couldn't have had it on her. I uh, went a block up the street, picked up a cab, and sat in it until she came out five minutes later. She was down in street clothes and carrying an overnight case. She drove to Castle Street, and I followed. She went into a restaurant called La Parisienne. I waited a distinct moment, then went in. She was nowhere to be seen, but a tall, lean, black-haired individual approached me with a menu in his hand. Good evening, monsieur. I regret to say we have just closed. No, I'm not interested in eating. Where's the girl who just came in? Girl? There's no girl in here. Nah, don't dummy on me. She walked right in here 30 seconds ago. Brown hair, red coat. Charmaine Roger, my name. You have made some mistake. As you can see, there is no one here. No, I've made no mistake. Now, now come on, clean. Monsieur, come on. Please let me go. The girl came in, but it was there is no place but I was the kitchen. All right, then show me the kitchen. Monsieur Renault. Monsieur. Oh, oh my. Spade. <laughs> well, it didn't take you long to get here, Mr. Montague. Well, I, I, I... Don't move, Mr. Spade. I have a knife at your throat. Yeah, I can feel it. Shall I take care of him, Mr. Montague? No, no. Put your knife down. Thanks. Mr. Spade and I will sit down at the table and talk quietly. You can go. As you say, monsieur, but I will keep out an eye. Let's keep an eye out. Sit down, please. Hmm. Spade, while you are here, I have a personal matter to take up with you. About the Josephine crown? Yes. Well, I'm sorry to report to you that as yet I haven't found it. Good. I'll be happy if you've never found it. Oh. Does uh, Mrs. Montague know you feel this way? No, and I'd be real happy if she didn't know. Uh-huh. In other words, you want me to stop looking for it. That's the idea. Oh, you make a pretense of trying to find it, but no more. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll pay you a good fee if you do this for me. Why don't you want it found, Mr. Montague? Uh, well, <clears throat> I'll talk to you man to man. Please do. A, uh, a French girl showed up in town. Charmaine Roger. Well, then you've seen her? Yeah, quite a bit of her uh, <laughs> at the party. Yeah, well, uh, she's young and beautiful, and uh, to get right to the point, I was indiscreet. I see. She turned out to be more designing than I realized. Blackmail? Of the sort. She didn't want to get money. She wanted the Josephine crown. And uh, you let them steal it. I told them I could get them into the party, furnish them with a car, and the rest was up to them. Why didn't you just give them the crown? Well, I, I couldn't. My wife values it too much. It's her prized possession. She even wears it around the house when just the two of us are there. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> now, will you just forget about this whole thing? Well, I'm afraid not, Mr. Montague. I'm hired out to your wife who asked me to guard it, and I did a bad job. Now it's up to me to get it back. Please, no, Spade. I, I, I can't afford another scandal with that girl. Well, you have to work that out for yourself. Well, I'm very sorry. Oh, I must admit, I, I underestimated the old philanderer. For at that point, he produced a gun out of thin air and very professionally relieved me of mine. He called the proprietor, Renault, and appeared with Charmaine Roger. They held an immediate kangaroo court. Sentence was about to be pronounced when the front door burst open and in swept a tall character in a black beret and cape and sporting a handlebar mustache. Uh-huh! 
providently pinned on his cape was a brace of French war medals, including the Croix de Guerre and so on. His entrance held everybody bug-eyed, including me. Keep your mouth shut, Spain. What joyous, charming gathering have we here? Uh, the glow of warm friendship fills the room like a cozy fireplace in Alsace Lorraine. Oh, it cannot be. It is my true mon ami, monsieur Montag. I, 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 I kiss you on both cheeks with happiness. Mwah, no, mwah. Hey, who are you? I, I, I don't seem to remember you. Oh, what? You are so soon forgetting me. We met at the Fallis Berger. Ah, those days. Do you not recall the nights in Montmartre and the days in Mont Blanc? When he bent over to kiss Montague again, his mustache fell off. As usual, Crockett had overplayed, and before he could straighten up, Benero hit him on the back of the head, and he fell on his, fat, flat on his face out cold. That was my cue to go into action. I turned over the table, wrestled with Horace Benero while Charmaine was striking me at the, he at the heel of her shoe. I got to the gun first, and everything came to a sudden lull. At that point, Fritz Crockett came too. Oh, ah, oh, uh, mes amis, where did the sudden darkness come from? Yeah, yeah, you can drop the dial at Crockett. Oh. Oh, I wish I had a picture of you there on the floor for your scrapbook. Oh, it, it, was, it was all in the act, Sam, all in the act. Yeah, well, do you think you're well enough to hold this gun while I make a search? Uh, leave it to me, Sammy. Everything will be under control. Now, stand back, everybody. I'm in charge here. The U.S. government is not entirely without influence in Washington. I found the Japanese crown hidden in the basement, and we called the police. I'm afraid the incident struck a blow at Franco-American relations when a certain Charmaine Rocher in Bonero produced two tickets, not for Paris or points French, but for Rio de Janeiro. And you know the rest, Mrs. Montague. Your husband went home and you forgave him. He made a superb gesture towards international harmony by returning the Josephine crown to the French Historical Society. And when you asked who might be the man to guard the crown back to La Belle France, I was overjoyed to be in a position to recommend to you Fritz Crockett. And I hope he marries uh, Suzette and stays over there. Period. And a report. Oh, Sam. Isn't that Fritz Crockett an exciting man? Yeah, don't let's talk about him anymore. Let him get his own program. First person in this office to mention his name again is a rotten egg. Now, go type that up. A Sam Spade Detective Agency. Oh, well, it's for you, Sam. Yeah. Hello? It's me, Sam. Fritz. Oh, no. I I'm at the airport. I just wanted to tell you I'll be out of town for a while. Won't be using the office, so just take the whole thing over. Well, thanks. That's very generous of you. And you can use Effie if you need her for anything. Well, I'll never be able to repay you. Ah, uh, that's all right. You did a pretty good job on the caper today. Thanks. I was just talking to Miss Montague, and I said to her, you know, that Sam is really coming along. I think someday he'll be able to ho hang his own license and be pretty much in that Sam! Sam, you're not even listening! Uh, I've had enough of him for one day. Come on here, Effie. You have to be satisfied with my one arm. Oh, that's good enough for me. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. And good night, Fritz. This episode of Sam Spade was directed by Philip Yeager and starred Ed Godzilla as Sam Spade, Gary Stamm, Amy Louise Seiler, Donna Hebert, Joan Rory, John McLaughlin, J.R. Trimark, featuring Can uh, Candy Helson on sound effects and Together Again duo. I'm your announcer, Nate Stamper. Bunny ears and a jeweled crown in the basement. Makes you want to go home and do some spring cleaning and see what you find. Well then again, maybe not. The times may have changed, but the crimes haven't. And Randy Stone will not rest until his next case is solved.
Night Beat was one of the most captivating dramas ever to be heard on radio. It featured Randy Stone as a tough, streetwise reporter who worked the Night Beat for the Chicago Star. He spends his nights looking for the human interest stories, the night people, the desperate, the lonely, the unwanted. Sometimes he could help them, sometimes he couldn't, but he always treats them with respect and shows both heart and toughness. Noir veteran Frank Lovejoy, most famous for his role in the film version of I Was a Communist for the FBI, played columnist Randy Stone with a cast of Hollywood's strongest supporting voices, often including the very recognizable William Conrad, Gunsmoke's Matt Dillon on the radio, along with Paul Fries and Lorraine Tuttle. Well, that dame sure easy on the eyes. Whatever the setting in the cast, Stone told quite a how I got the story tale from his opening summary to his wrap-up remarks. Enjoy this episode of Night Beat, Railroaded. NBC presents Transcribed Frank Lovejoy in Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the Night Beat for Chicago Star. My world is neatly divided into two parts, day and night. Part one you can have with its fume-laden sunshine and noisy peddlers selling everything from eternal youth elixirs to slightly used atom bombs. Part two I'll stick with, the neon signs that have just been turned off, the cop trying the door of Sam's We Paid Cash for Everything secondhand store. Yes, I'm happy to commit the merry sunshine hours to sleep, therefore, my phone ringing at 11 o'clock in the morning can constitute a dissonant, irritating, and annoying sound. Oh, wrong number. What do you want? This is Billy at the paper. That you, Randy? Yeah, it's me, Randy. Lucky I found you home. <laughs> yeah, sure. Special delivery letter just came for you. So, who's it from? Well, it doesn't say on the envelope. Well, open it if you haven't already. <sighs> well... It's signed, Dolly Graham. Yeah, I'm booked solid for the next two weeks. It's that Dolly Graham, Randy. I'll read it to you. Look, Billy, I don't Dear have Mr. It. Stone, you're always looking for a story. I've got one for you. I can prove that I was not responsible for Mrs. Thompson's death and that I've been framed. What Thompson death? There's more. Please come and see me today, signed Dolly Graham. That's great. Now, maybe you'll tell me who Dolly Graham is? Now, try reading The Star once in a while, Randy. Dolly Graham's the girl whose car crashed into Paul Thompson's and killed his wife. She was convicted last week on a manslaughter charge. Which Thompson? Uh, the guy running for the state senate? That's him. That's why I called you, Randy. The boss thought there might be a story in this. Uh, fine. Well, tell him to break up a canasta game and send one of the day boys over to see her. Look, Randy, Paul Thompson's news these days. If the paper could hit the street with something hot. Where is she? Women's Detention, California Avenue. It might be a good idea if you came down here first and read up a little on the trial. Did I say I was going? <laughs> you're fighting it, Randy, but you're losing. Okay, I'll be right down, but I'll hate myself for it. I adjusted my perspective to daytime living, and a couple of hours later, I was down at the paper's library reading up on the trial of the People versus Dolly Graham. The Graham girl hadn't had a chance. According to witnesses, she'd driven her car out of her own driveway at a dangerously high rate of speed and had run straight into Thompson's car. To cinch the case against her, the DA pointed out that the girl had two previous reckless driving citations, and at the time of the accident, her driver's permit had been suspended public sympathy had all been with the Thompson family. From the facts, any guy in his senses would have forgotten the whole thing. But then, nobody's ever been able to prove that I am. So I went over to women's detention for a visit with Dolly Graham. 
the matron I discovered was an old friend of mine. Randy Stone. Glad to see you. Drop a chair. <laughs> I got a pass to see Dolly Graham, Nellie. I'll visit with you later. Graham? What do you want to see her about? Well, confidentially, Dal, I got a little steel saw for her. <laughs> All right, come on. I hope you're not going for that malarkey about her being innocent. Well, I got an open mind, Nellie. You know that. Those wild, irresponsible kids. Put them behind the wheel of a car and it's murder. Plain murder. Well, that's just what the DA said. Do you know her license had been suspended? I read that. What do you want to mess around with her for? It's an open and shut case. Well, I don't like open and shut cases. Cheesecake. The trial read like a bad play written for the star performer only. In this case, Mr. Paul Thompson. You're crazy, but I love you anyways, Randy. Maybe if you shave regularly. <laughs> hey, you got a visitor, dearie. Who is he? 19 years old. She might as well be 90. Ten minutes, Randy. Okay. If you need help, just holler. And I wouldn't be too surprised. Well? I'm Randy Stone. What does that call for? Three cheers? Well, I'm the Randy Stone, Chicago star, the one you sent for. I sent for you? You must be nuts. Got a cigarette? Yeah, here. Keep them. Thanks. What are you staring at? You're just a kid, a, a frightened kid trying to hide it behind a cloud of cigarette smoke. All right. So I'm scared. What do you want? I got this letter from you this morning, special delivery. This was your idea. I didn't write any letter. Let's see it. Here. It's my name, but I didn't write this letter. Well, well read it. I am. Make any sense to you? Just this, about George Saunders. He was in the car with me when it happened. Not according to the testimony. He beat it before the police got there. I told him about it at the trial, but they didn't believe me. Well, why'd he run out on you? He'd broken parole, I think, in Kansas or Wyoming, someplace like that. They tried to make a deal with me. Well, who did? He told me if I pleaded guilty, it'd be treated just like any other traffic accident. But I told him, no, it wasn't my fault, so they made it manslaughter. A politician's wife was killed. Well, your record made it a cinch to convict you. Tom Thompson's car crashed into mine, I tell you. A car's always been sort of a mechanical toy to you, hasn't it? Oh, no, not another lecture coming up. I'm sorry, Dolly. That's the good citizen in me. Keeps coming out every once in a while. Go on. The lawyer told me not to try and ball, uh, to try and buck Paul Thompson. He said Thompson couldn't afford any unfavorable publicity on account of his running for the Senate. So here I am. I'd like to know who sent this letter. You're wasting your time, Mr. Stone. Well, you keep talking. Try to... Well, tell me anything that you can remember. <sighs> I was waiting for this car to pass. My car was standing still in the driveway, and, and I swear it, the, his car started weaving like he was drunk or something. Next thing I know, crash! Well, the Thompson car rolled over on its side. You remember that? First thing I saw was her, the wife, lying in the street, dead. Then I heard someone get out of the other car, so I ran over to see if I could help. And by this time, your boyfriend had disappeared, I take it. Mr. Thompson was helping his daughter out. He said something to her, and then she started running down the street. What did he say to her? I heard it, but I don't remember exactly. Well, he testified in court that he told her to go and bring a doctor. Is that what he said? No, it was nothing about a doctor. He, he told her... What? I'm trying to think. Something about home. The words. Try to think of the exact words. Go on home, I think he said. Go on home, Anne, and I'll look after things myself. That's all he said to her. Uh-huh. This friend of yours, George Saunders. Then Mr. Thompson kind of staggered over to where his wife was, and he, he fainted, and people started coming all around, and they were shouting at me and blaming me, and Mr. Bell told everybody he'd seen me do it. Oh, that's the next-door neighbor? He lied! He told him it was my fault. I don't know why, but he lied. I have to talk with him, Dolly. Oh, it's no use. What did the DA call me? 
an irresponsible, wide-eyed lady of the night. <laughs> you should have seen the way the jury's eyes lit up when he said that. I knew it was all over then. You haven't told me about Saunders. Where can I find him? He played at the jazz bar on Higgins Avenue. You know it? <laughs> yeah. They wanted me to plead guilty to the accident. Well, I guess I should have. There's something screwy about Thompson helping that girl out of the car, but I don't know what it is. Time's up, Randy. Okay. Do you believe me, Mr. Stone? Yeah, I believe you. But what does that mean? Nothing. I'm a notorious screwball about such things. I believed her. Maybe it was intuition. Maybe it was just the frightened, pleading look in the girl's eyes. I went back to the office and read the trial records again. If ever a conviction had been prefabricated, Dolly Graham had gotten it. The evidence had been flimsy, the witness unreliable, and several times the jury had been reminded of Mr. Thompson's fine record as a citizen in the community. I worked myself into a belligerent frame of mind and went looking for Mr. George Saunders at the jazz bar in Higgins Avenue. Waitress told me that he hadn't worked there since the day after Dolly Graham's accident. By 2 a.m., I was convinced that George Saunders wasn't in Chicago. So I went back to the office and wrote a vitriolic column about trials and courtroom procedures. Nothing specific, you understand, just a poisonous spit about how many people are railroaded into jail sentences because of a willingness to find a person guilty before the trial. Then I went home, set the alarm for one o'clock in the afternoon, and went to bed. The mechanical monster did its work, and by two o'clock, I was climbing the few steps to Mr. Bell's porch, Dolly's neighbor, the one who'd sworn he'd seen the accident take place. Yep, 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 yep. Ah, uh, Mr. Bell? Yeah, that's me. What do you want? It's about that Thompson accident case. <laughs> I ought to start charging for all the talking I've been doing about that. Uh, my name is Stone. I'm with the Chicago Star. Oh, I read it all the time. Well, we're uh, thinking of doing a feature story, pictures of you and your wife, the works. As soon as she moved into the rooming house next door, <laughs> I knew what kind she was. Ah, you saw the actual crash take place, Mr. Bell. I was sitting right here. She came shooting out of her driveway. She was doing like 40. I bet an reckless murderous reckless yeah your chair was right there where it is now <laughs> same spot i said she ran over my dog and killed my dog and did it deliberate you think she was sorry for that <laughs> not her well maybe you just heard the crash mr bell could that be mind letting me sit in that chair for a minute <laughs> go ahead thank you Now, what do you want to do that for? I'm just trying to figure out how you could have seen the driveway from here. All I can see is a brick wall and two big trees. Well, now, you wouldn't make me out to be a liar now, would you? <laughs> I seen it all. Uh, you must have had yourself a trick set of eyes then. I told them in court, I seen it, and they believed me. Well, maybe you saw it because you wanted to see it. You weren't exactly fond of that girl, you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's nothing to do with it. If I hadn't seen it, I'd have said so. You've had that be hanging a foot over the railing before you could have seen the accident. Well, maybe that's what I was doing then. You can't make no liar out of me. You, you, you go talk to Miss Marks. She lives in the same house as that Graham girl. And she's seen it too. Uh-huh. I'm going to. Oh, is it all right if I send somebody around here later to take some pictures? Oh, oh, oh why, sure thing. And, and oh, 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 say, if you're writing something in the paper, don't forget to say that the missus 
is a fine dressmaker. Oh, she's one of the best in this section, so you be sure to get that all done. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll headline that fact. Yes? I'm a newspaper reporter. I'd like an interview with you. Oh, come on in. I'll turn off the radio and you sit down. Thank you. Care for some wine? Sherry? <laughs> no, thank you. Sherry's good for you. The other stuff is poison. Yeah, so I've heard. Makes you feel better if you're uh, ill. And it helps time go quicker. Hey, you were talking next door to Mr. Bell about Dolly Graham. I heard you through the window. You know Dolly? She had more boyfriends no. than... Good-looking girl. Hair just like mine was. Mine was natural, though. <sighs> Would you think it to see me now? I was pretty, too. Sure. Hey, you're not out of it yet. Uh, about the crash? Oh, I'm tired of talking about that accident. You heard her leaving her room? Laughing. He was kidding her. Well, in court, you said that she came out alone. I said I wasn't sure if she was with somebody else. Oh, but you heard a man's voice? Maybe. Oh, there were no long, empty evenings for her. Not like some people have. She used to rid me about it. Said she'd fix me up with a date, stuff like that. It hurts. Well, you were looking out of the window when it happened. Yeah. There was nobody in Dolly's car with her? No. She said she ran out on her. Uh, I didn't see him. And that's a laugh, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. When it came right down to a pinch, she was alone, too. Even the young, pretty ones are alone. <laughs> I had a time of it when the reporters and police started coming around. <sighs> but even that didn't last too long. Did you see... I'm God, not much mind. good to you, am I, mister? Well... Thanks, anyway. Hmm. I checked into the office about 3 o'clock. Billy, the managing editor's girl Friday, collared me. Randy, come into the office for a minute. Ah. What's the matter, Billy? You look very unhappy about something. Not me, the managing editor. It's, um, this morning's column of yours. It's directed against Paul Thompson, isn't it? Well, generally speaking, yes. Specifically, no. Well, you know the star is supporting him in his bid for the Senate. Yeah, and if I insinuate the trial left a pretty foul order behind, it's because I think so. A judge tries her, a jury convicts her, but Stone the Avenger thinks she's been railroaded. Like a rocket-powered express. Mm, Thompson's attorney phoned. The M.E. wants no more of it. Oh, I see. As a matter of fact, Thompson wants to talk to you. Since when is the star influenced by politicians? The proof's one thing, Randy. Conjecture's another. Give the boss proof and he'll print it. Uh, the girl is taking a phony rap. I'm sure of it. All right, all right. Get yourself fired. I sent one of the photographers down to take some pictures from the neighbor's house. Those pictures are going to prove the guy was lying. He said he saw the accident he couldn't have. You're going to need something a lot more conclusive than that before you can make a story out of it, Randy. I know it. I know it. I'm working on two more angles. First, to find out who wrote this letter. Then to find Dolly's boyfriend, the missing musician. Well, you believe there was a guy with her? Yeah. Let me look at that letter. A friend of mine, Al Harriman, is on the board of the local musicians' union. He's trying to trace this for Saunders for me. If he phones while I'm out, will you take a message? Mm-hmm. Um, this is a girl's handwriting, Randy. You sure? I'm pretty sure. Uh, it was mailed from Wilmette late last night. It's about 30 miles from here, high-class residential section. I, I, I live here, remember? The boss told Mr. Thompson you'd call him as soon as we heard from you. Ah, it's late, Billy. Well, he said no matter what time it was, he wants to see you. Well, I'll go see him now. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, if Harriman phones, take the message. Mm -hmm. Harriman? The guy from the Musicians Union about Saunders. Oh. Uh, now, how about Paul Thompson? Uh, he lives in the Nelson Apartments in Lakewood Terrace. Good. I'll call you as soon as he's had me bounced out on the street. Half an hour later, a nurse ushered me into Thompson's study. She'd warned me that Mr. Thompson was a pretty sick man and that I shouldn't say anything to excite or disturb him. She closed the door behind me. He looked old and tired, and he waved me to a chair near him. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I can't rise to receive you. I haven't been well lately. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, you left a message you wanted to see me? Well, obviously, we had to meet very shortly, so I took the initiative. Yeah. 
Now, I'm told you were disturbed about my column in this morning star. Both in its tone and its contents were clearly directed against my family. I was attacking a series of principles, not any individuals. Running as I am for the Senate next month, your insinuations must have an adverse effect on my campaign. I have learned that you are conducting a private investigation into the, the tragic death of my wife. Well, to deny that would be stupid. In the face of such overwhelming evidence as was presented in the court, do you mean to say that further inquiries could serve any useful purpose? Well, that remains to be seen. I, I'm interested in facts only, Mr. Thompson. I, I think you can help end my investigation here and now. How? Well, let me talk to your daughter. Is she home? She's in no condition to see anyone. Poor child is on the point of a serious breakdown. She's never recovered from that horrible night. A few words with her, that's all I want. It's impossible. She's not in the city at any rate. Well, where is she? Mr. Stone, I've wanted nothing so much in my life as I want that seat in the Senate. That's a laudable ambition, sir. I shall let no obstacle stand in my way. Hmm. In time, you should get the presidency. I have thought of a solution that might be compatible to both of us. Well, nothing would suit me better. I've been searching for a young, aggressive man to run my campaign for me. I'm afraid I'm losing you. Well, you are that man, Mr. Stone. Whatever your present salary is, I will double it under contract for three years. I see. These attacks on my family must stop. I can't fight it, so I'll buy it. You've got this figured out for some high-class journalistic blackmail, haven't you, Mr. Thompson? There must be no more un unfavor unfavorable publicity. What's the matter, Mr. Thompson? What is it? Di diabetic. Excellent on the table. Do, do you know how to administer it? No. What can I do? The nurse. The nurse. Call, call her now. Quickly. Nurse. In here. Quick. The nurse gave him the insulin, and I watched life come back to him. He tried to talk to me, but the ins nurse insisted that I go, an order I lost no time in carrying out. I got to a phone as fast as I could and called Billy at the paper. Hello. Billy, I want you to do something for me in a hurry. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Your friend from the Musicians' Union phoned. Uh, well? He's located Saunders at the Exeter Hotel, downtown room 312. Oh, good, good. Now, if I can... Get to him tonight. Well, he's I... in his room. I checked with the clerk, and I sent one of the boys down to follow him in case he leaves. Thanks, Billy. It's uh, nice to have you on the team. I saw the pictures taken from Bell's porch. He couldn't possibly have seen the accident. Yeah. I'll go and talk to the musician right away. Now, here's what you got to do for me. Yeah? Go down to the Motor Vehicles License Bureau. Give me all the information you can on the Thompson's driver's licenses, both the old man's and the girl's. What's on your mind, Randy? I don't know yet. Well, I don't know if they'll give me any inf information this time of night. Well, give them a spiel about the Public Records Act. That'll work. When'll I see you? As soon as I can bring Saunders back to give us tomorrow's front page story. Tommy Sullivan was one of my colleagues on the Star. He was waiting for me in the lobby of the hotel. The musician was still in his room, he told me. He climbed two flights of stairs, a dingy fire trap. Saunders was in his room all right. Hmm. I knew it as soon as I stood outside his door. Come on in. Hi. Be with you in a minute. Don't want to let go of this lick. How'd you like it? That sounded great. I don't think I know you. What was it you wanted? It's about Dolly Graham. You a policeman? <clears throat> no. So what was it you wanted? I talked to her yesterday. She said that you were in the car with her when it happened. Does the jury believe that's important now? You were with her in the car? Just give me a yes or no. Yeah, I guess I was. And you wouldn't step in and help the girl out? I thought about it lots of times. I didn't have the guts. I'm wanted out west. I jump parole, and if they ever get their hands on me, it'd be too bad. Too bad, don't you see? Oh, you're a nice boy. 
You're coming with me now. I can't. I thought for sure he'd be, she'd beat the case. We were just sitting there. I said, the guy who's driving, he's drunk. The guy who was driving? Sure, it was a man. I saw him. His daughter said she was driving the car. Well, she wasn't. Well, come on. We're going places. You don't understand. I just can't do it. Well, I'll help you. Now, get moving. Now, get me on that Kansas thing. The stairs are kind of narrow. You better walk ahead of me. So it was the man driving. I don't know what he hit me with. If it was a fist, it had been milled by the American Steel Company. I went down and he got away from me. A couple of aspirins and a cab ride later, I was back at the office. What happened to you? Yeah, the musician hit and ran. He got away. What did you find out about the licenses? Thompson's daughter, Anne. She had a license issued to her, all right. A day after the accident. After the accident? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beginning to gel. Mm -hmm, that isn't all. Thompson's own license had been revoked over a year ago for reasons of health. Huh. That's all they'd tell me. Well, how's it look to you, Randy? Yeah, Thompson was driving. That's why he helped the girl out of the car. He got out first. He knew there'd be no doubt of his criminal responsibility, so he got the girl. Yeah, proof. We've got to prove it. Well, I'm pretty sure I know how to get it. I think I know who sent me this letter. Ann Thompson? Yeah. She just couldn't go along with it all the way. The old man knew it, too. That's why I kept her out of town. Well, the letter was postmarked well met. Shouldn't be hard to find her. You gonna see her tonight? Let's get busy at it. Wasn't too hard to find the girl. The postmark in the letter directed us to Wilmetta, high class residential area, 40 miles out of the city. The telephone operator knew just who I meant, the Thompson girl, visiting with an aunt on Elm Street. I drove out there. The girl must have been waiting for me. I'd hardly started to press the bell on the door when it opened. Yes? I got your letter this morning. Oh, come in, Mr. Stone. Thank you. Uh, have you have you seen my father? Yeah. Is he all right? He's all right. I was hoping you'd come. I, I I couldn't go on hiding a thing like that the rest of my life, could I? No, you couldn't. Oh, Dad didn't know Mother was uh, was dead. He thought it was just a traffic accident. So he told you to say that you'd been driving. He shouldn't have been driving. The doctor warned him. Oh. Do you have to take me back to the city with you? Yes, I think you'd better. The police will want to talk to you and a lot of other people, too. All right. I felt so bad when I had to tell those lies in court. Yeah, I know. The girl standing there, staring at me, I felt like crying. And I, and I feel like crying now. <laughs> Come on, honey. It's, it's a long drive back to town. <sighs> So, what does it prove? Maybe nothing. But then look at it this way. Dolly Graham almost served a prison term because of a chain of what amounted to perjured testimony. Oh, nothing intentional, mind you. Mr. Bell was too righteous a man to deliberately swear falsely. He just called his shots the way he thought they should be. The same with the lonely Miss Marks, who substituted bitterness and a small drop of sherry for the truth and nothing but the truth. And Mr. Thompson, who couldn't possibly lose the Senate race. See how some of the facts became confused in their minds because first they were confused in their hearts? And that's the truth of the matter. And those are the facts, yep. By golly, honest Injun and sure thing. <laughs> Copy boy! Night Beat, starring Doug Despin, is produced and directed by Nita Hunter. Featured in tonight's cast were Amy Louise Seiler, Donna Aber, Leslie Utech, Joan Rory, Jan Mikulski, Gary Stamm, and Candy Helson. Also featuring Candy Helson on sound effects and the Together Again duo. I'm your announcer, Nate Stamper.
stay tuned after the intermission when Dragnet brings you authentic adventure of your police force. And we feature another episode of Rebecca Diamond, Private Eye. <laughs> Drunkenness, power, lies, and death, all for politics. Not all private detectives are men. Even the dames got into the act. Rebecca Diamond illustrates this in our next story. She's a tough-talking private eye trying to make it in a world full of men, such as Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe. But she's got a soft spot for the victim, and she's out to prove that crime does not pay. She can travel in the highest circles of power and navigate the darkest, dirtiest streets of New York City. She's Rebecca Diamond, Private Eye. exactly start out to be a P.I. I was helping my brother Chick get out of a jam, a logger of a jam, all over a dame, the wrong dame. I know all about making bum choices. I left my husband Staunton, who had a bigger ego than Central Park and wasn't afraid to use it to get what he wanted. And despite the title of this episode, when I met him, I was no angel either. These days, I'm palling around with my partner, Franklin Marsh. We're private dicks. A girl's got to make a living in New York City, and I found having a guy around who does think you're an angel isn't half bad. Back then, about that wrong dame, I caught Ruby Rose Redding at breakfast time. Hers, not mine. Quarter to three in the afternoon. Yes, ma'am, who do you wish to see? I see her already, so skip the Morris Code. Rebecca Diamond's the name. Mean anything to you? Should it? <laughs> oh, she was bad medicine. I could tell. I'd had enough experience from my dance hall days to see the finish right there in her eyes. Breakfast untouched, glass of bromo seltzer half empty. <laughs> I don't mind coming out with it right in front of your maid if you don't. And what do I pay you for anyway? Take foo-foo around the block a few more times. I took him once already, and he was a good boy. Well, take him again. Maybe you can kid him that it's tomorrow already. <laughs> you sure didn't enjoy yourself last night at the store yeah. club. That place never do agree with you. Now that the gallery's gone, I'm here to tell you, lay off my brother. Well, Gracie Allen, you've come to the wrong place looking for your brother. But just for the record, what am I supposed to have done with him? Cured of him of wiping his nose on his sleeve or something? He's been spending dough like wild and it's not coming from his salary. Then where does it come from? If she was going to play dumb with me, I knew I'd have to change gears. I was about to give a performance, but money couldn't pay for it. It came straight from the heart. There's a little girl in the neighborhood, might not think she's much, thinks 12 o'clock is the middle of the night and storks leave babies, but she loves my brother and she's all he's got. Maybe between the two of them pinching pennies and nickels, they can make something of themselves. I can't stand by and watch you chew them up. Pick on someone your own size and have some fun, but not with all I've got. All right, all right, is the screen test over? 
I've heard stories like this from wives and girlfriends, but now a sister. If you think I'm poisoned, why don't you put it up to your brother? And see how far you get! So I did put it up to Chick when I saw him back at our apartment. We'd been bunking together since I struck out on my own. Chick. You're not going to ditch your job. You're not going to Chicago with that dame, are you? How did you know? Oh, I saw your suitcase packed when I wanted to send one of your suits to the cleaners. Well, you ought to be a detective. Well, now that you mention it... Chick, I'm not asking for myself. I'm older than you, and I've been around plenty. Sometimes around wasn't pretty, working in clubs and slugging myself home at five in the morning just so you wouldn't turn out to be some corner lizard, some sharpshooter I've seen so many times. Chick, you're just a punk of 24. What do you know? What's wrong with little Mary Ellen? Just because she doesn't have a face that came off a box doesn't mean you have to pass her by for something that ought to be shampooed out of your hair with gasoline. Get away from that door. I never raised a hand to you in my life, and I don't want it now. Don't go, Chick. You're heading straight for the eight ball. Don't go to her. Chick! I guess it was my day for door slams. About four that morning, I was still sniveling into the gin that he'd left behind him and talking to him across the table, without getting any answer, when the doorbell rang. I thought it was him for a moment, but it was two other guys. They didn't ask if they could come in, they just flashed their tin and pushed through. One of them wasn't bad looking. I mean, he'd washed his face lately. And if he was the last man in the world, well, I might have overlooked the fact that he was a bloodhound with two legs. The other one had a cobblestone looking face. Franklin Morris, NYPD, and this is Sergeant McAllister. Mind if we take a look around? They'd look the place over pretty good, like they were prospective tenants or something. Three closets and you get a month's concession. What am I, putting you up? You're Rebecca Diamond, aren't you? Who wants to know? Oh, Chick Diamond, sister, right? I got a brother. I call him Chick. Any ordinance against that? Don't be so hard to handle. You're going to talk to us and like it. Now, what time did he leave here this morning? I really couldn't say. I'm not a train dispatcher. He was going to Chicago with a dame named Ruby Rose Redding. You know that, didn't you? <laughs> Why would he want to run off with a woman with a name like that? Sounds like it came off a bottle of nail polish. Come to the point, gentlemen. What's he supposed to have done? Uh, there's no reason or no question to what he's done. He went to the uh, Alcazar Arms at 8.15 tonight and throttled Ruby Rose Redding to death, angel face. <laughs> Ah, uh, don't give it to her that sudden. She's a girl, after all. He didn't do it, I tell ya. All right. I did know her. And my brother had a thing for her. That's why I know he didn't do it, see? You don't kill the thing you love. <laughs> you go to bat for the thing you love, too. Look, I've been on the squad for eight years now and never caught a guy as dead to rights as your brother. Showed up with his suitcase in the foyer of the Alcazar. The doorman rang Mrs. Redding's apartment, and she gave out a dirty laugh and sang out, I can hardly wait. So at 13 past eight, she was still alive. Shortly after he heads up, someone from the apartment starts ringing for the doorman frantically. So he heads up and finds your brother standing over her, shaking her. She was dead at 15 minutes past eight. <laughs> Is that a case? Or is that a case? How do you know someone else wasn't in the apartment and strangled her just before Chick showed up? It's got to be that. And what do you think they have Dorman for? Says no one visited Mr. Redding all day, and she's only been dead 15 or 20 minutes before the medical examiner got to her. Did Chick say he did it? <laughs> no one ever admits it. Of course not. He says he was crouched over her, trying to restore her. All right. I did it. How do you like that? I couldn't stand the thought of him throwing his life away for her, so I, I paid her a visit. I gave her one last chance. She didn't take it, so I just took a hard grip and pushed her. And the doorman? His back was turned. I slipped in. Yeah, come on. Let's go nothing here. 
Wait, aren't you going to take me with you and let Chick go? One question, Miss Diamond. What were you wearing when you killed her? Well, I was too steamed up to see what she was wearing. No, I didn't notice any colors or anything, but she had on her coat, she had on her hat, like she was ready to leave. Sure, sure. I, I guess she took them off, though, after she was dead and wasn't going anywhere after all. We found her in her pajamas. Write us a nice long letter about it tomorrow, Angel Face. We'll see you at the trial. You rotten, low-down detective, you! Get out of here! I hope I never see your face again! Well, maybe you did it after all. Maybe I'm underestimating you. Two weeks later, the jury filed in at the end of the trial and found my brother Chick guilty. I couldn't stand after it was over, and a handkerchief with ammonia fumes got me up off the floor. The good-looking Dick Marsh helped me into a taxi and got me home. I spent the ride being disgusted with the private lawyer I'd hired for my brother and Marsh telling me that if he'd pleaded to a lesser degree, he might not be in line for short-circuiting. Why would he lie down and accept 20 years? He didn't lay a hand on Ruby Red Redding. 11 million people, the mighty state of New York, say that he did. Don't come in with me. I don't want to see any more of you. If I was a man, I'd knock you down and beat the living hell out of you. You need help, Angel Face, and I'm crying to give it to oh, you. Oh, binding the hand that feeds you, turning double-crosser. No, no, sell me, won't you? T sell me that he's innocent, and I'll work my fingers raw to back you up. I didn't frame your brother. I only did my job. Don't hold that against me, Angel Face. Sell me. Convince me. Convince me he didn't do it, and I'm with you to the hilt. Why? Why this sudden yearning to undo the damage you've already done? Look in the mirror sometime and find out. You can meet me later at Frankie's on 18th Street. Franklin Marsh. Okay, Flatfoot. No use holding it against you that you're a detective. Say, before you go, give me that address of the maid of hers. I got a hunch she didn't tell all she knew. She went home at five that day. How can she help you? Mm, let's just say she knew who to expect around. Yeah, here it is. 118th, just off, just off Linux, in here. Uh, take that. If you're going to restore her memory, it'll take some heavy sugar. Use it where it'll do the most good. Try a little intimidation. 150 bucks? Hey, aren't you married or anything? Nah, I can always get it back anyway, if it doesn't do the trick. Besides, I... Always wanted to have something on you, Angel Face. Later, tonight, Frankie's. A quick look into the maid turned up something interesting. She'd been run over right on the street of her Edgecombe neighborhood. I went away from her house thinking, that girl's been murdered sure as the day as I was born, to shut her mouth. Following up on Baker, Ms. Redding's doorman, added to the mess. Turns out he recently inherited a large amount of money from relatives from Europe and left the country. <laughs> Obviously paid off. I began to think, no wonder it was such a locked case on my brother. If I was sitting at Frankie's with an, I was sitting at Frankie's with an old fashioned, I like mine with olives, when Franklin walked in. Here's your 150 back. I'm up against a stone wall at every turn. Don't lose the faith, Angel Face. But you've got to move quickly. I ask you, is it coincidence that the minute the case is in the bag, two of the prime witnesses were either done in by a hit and run or paid off and shipped off to Europe? Keep going, keep going. You're, you're selling me now. Smells like rain. It's like this. Some guy did it. Some guy was sold on her. Plenty of names were spilled by the maid and the doorman, but I can't put a face on them. The mechanics of it don't trouble me a bit. Easy to figure out, but it's the who that's got me. There's a gap there, and I just can't cross to the other side. I like your way of thinking, Rebecca. You should consider joining the force. Ah, uh, no time to think about that. I gotta close this gap, or I might as well order Chick's headstone now. <laughs> Hate to say it, Rebecca, but time is running out. He comes up for sentence Wednesday. In his own 
way, Franklin wanted me to know he's on my side. He left the paper behind, so I picked it up with the intention of losing my thoughts behind it. And I saw her name. Yeah, she'd been in the paper for weeks, but this was different. This was a little boxed off on the side. Auction sale, jewelry, personal effects, furniture belonging to the late Ruby Redding, Monarch Galleries, Saturday AM. I ran to the door of Frankie's. Hey, Franklin, bring that back that 150. I've changed my mind. The auction house was packed, as I suspected it would be. I kept my eyes on the customers, hoping to see someone who looked just out of line. They called the usual stuff, her diamonds, her furs, her thises, her thats. But that's not what I was interested in. I was looking for someone to start bidding on something unusual. Toward the end of the auction, I got my action, when the barker held up a small wooden jewelry box. What am I offered for this lovely little trinket box? Give it to your wife or your mother to keep her ornaments in or old love letters. You hear a buck? <laughs> he was a tough looking guy in my same row. Exactly the type I'd been looking for, so I threw my hat in the ring. If he wanted it, I wanted it. You hear a dollar and a quarter? Dollar fifty. Two dollars. Five. Seven fifty. Ten. Twelve. Twenty five dollars. Thirty. To my surprise, he left it at that, and I walked out of the auction house with a small wooden jewelry box belonging to Ms. Redding. I knew I'd be followed home, so I took a couple different subway routes, and when I arrived at my apartment, I looked out the window, but I didn't see anyone around. The knock at my door later that afternoon showed a bit of impatience. All right, Rebecca, what do you got? <laughs> I've got them, that's what. Bought this jewelry box at the auction house, but I knew it must have held something important because the bidding went up pretty high. Got home and discovered this note from a Milt. She got it the day she died. Go ahead, read it out loud. You know, baby, I think too much of you to ever let you go. And if you ever tired of me and tried to leave me, I'd kill you first. And then you could go wherever you want. They tell me you've been seen going around a lot lately with some young punk. Now, baby, for his sake and yours, I hope when I come around tomorrow, I find it isn't so. Just some more of my boss's lies. <laughs> Only he fooled her and came home early. Found her with Chick. Milt. Milt Milt, of course. Uh, owns several nightclubs on Broadway. Everyone knows him. But notice how his name never came up on trial. Also known for playing rough with women. Unfortunately, kid, there's not enough here to pin on him, though. Hmm, just the same. You rush out and photostat them, and I'm going to cook up something else. What club did you say he owns? Uh, Hell's Bells, down on Broadway. Oh, wait a minute. You stay out of there. You're playing a dangerous game. One word from you. Didn't take me long to get a job at Hell's Bells. Girls got to eke out a living in New York City, and somehow I hold my own. My tight little shimmer dress caught the attention of my buddy Milt pretty fast, and before I knew it, he sent for me and had a bottle of champagne waiting at the table. After I cozied up to him a bit, sure enough, he slipped his key into a handkerchief and passed it under the table and invited me to see him on my next night off. Franklin was right. I was playing a dangerous game. But I was determined to get my brother Chick off the chair, and at that point, I'd have done anything. I snuck out of the club and headed over to his apartment, which turned out to be a penthouse. Luckily, the doorman was a little sleepy, and I told him my visit had been arranged. Once inside, I headed upstairs and began work in the bedroom. I found the jewelry case all right, empty. I needed to find some evidence to pin on him for Ms. Redding's murder, so I kept digging. All of a sudden, the phone rang. I ran downstairs, turned out the lights, picked up the receiver, and said nothing. Angel face. You sure frightened me. Better get out of there now. He just came back. A spotter at Hell's Bells just tipped me off. He was uh, just asking where you'd gone. I can't. The doorman will tip him off. I was just here. I'll have to play dumb. Get anything? Nah, only that jewel case and it was empty. 
I couldn't get the safe open, but he probably burned everything about her long ago. Hey, get out of there, kid, now. You, you don't know this guy. He's, he's going to pin you down on the mat if he finds you there. I'm staying. I'm going to break him down tonight. It's my last chance. Chick eats chicken and ice cream tomorrow night at six. Oh, Franklin, pray for me, will you? Going to do more than that. I'm doing a wrong number call there in 30 minutes. If you're doing all right, I'll lay low. If you're not, I'm breaking in with some of the guys, and we'll use whatever we got on Mr. Milton. We'll at least buy Chick a reprieve. We've got to get him, and we're going to. I'm convinced in my own mind he's guilty. Remember, half an hour. If everything's okay, cough. If I don't hear you cough, I'm pulling the place. I pulled open the closet doors looking for the negligee he told me I'd find waiting for me and chased downstairs, grabbed a cigarette in an old-fashioned, just in time. When he came in here, he had a face full of storm clouds. Until he saw me. Decided you wanted to change the scenery, huh? A day early. You been here long? Get out, you two. Can't you see I got company? Hey, 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 hey. I recognize that dame. She's got. She's the one I got the box from. And Get I... out of here, will you? Don't right. call my lady friends dames. All right, boss. All right. Milton spent quite a bit of time working on the theory that I found him irresistible, and after what seemed like years of that, I sidestepped him neatly and getting off the divan just in time. He got good and peeved, finally. The door opened and I could see we weren't done with his stooge quite yet. I knew I was in trouble. She's double-crossing you, boss. She came here to frame you, and I know it. <laughs> I knew she looked familiar when I went to pick up the box from her apartment. Your chick, Diamond Sister. I saw you at the trial. She's a stoolie. Who are you? What does he mean? You're too beautiful to be killed. Then don't have me killed. <laughs> I pulled the negligee tightly around me and looked at the clock. It was two minutes to five. I got you if you're that guy's sister. I say I'm nobody's sister. Just angel face who dances at your club. How come you snuck out of the club early to get here? I like soft carpets. She's Diamond's sister, boss. And don't let her... Shut up! Okay. But you'll find out. I'll get that. You cover her. <laughs> Rocco stood over me with a Smith & Wesson and waved it vaguely in my direction. I wasn't even sure he knew how to use it, but I wasn't about to find out. No, you tell me what number you want first, then I'll tell you what number this is. That's the way it's done. Yeah, hung up on me. They started to tie me off, and I got to thinking... I don't mind horribly dying so much, but I hated to think I didn't help Chick. Oh, maybe it's better this way. I don't have to grow old and nobody has to look at your face anymore. Well, I'd show him I could die like a gentleman. I pulled out my compact and adjusted my makeup. Knock her out, Rocco. I don't want to look at her face no more. <laughs> okay, <laughs> boss. <laughs> Franklin! What did you kill him for? Now we'll never get the evidence we need to free Chick. We got all the evidence we need. It's right on you. While you're holding your side there. Just like it was for Miss Redding. We all heard what he said before he nosedived anyway. I only wish I hadn't shot him. Then I'd have the pleasure of doing it all over again slowly. Good thinking, Franklin. You're a handy guy to have around. I could stick around on a more permanent basis. Let's talk at Frankie's. I'm ready for an old-fashioned. Make mine a double. Today's episode of Rebecca Diamond was created and directed by Nita Hunter and based on a story written by Cornell Woolrich in 1943 and starred Leslie Utek as Rebecca Diamond and Gary Stamm as Franklin Marsh. Also featuring Doug Despin, Ed Gajula, 
Joan Rory, John McLaughlin, Jan Michalski, and I'm your announcer, Nate Stamper. Candy Helson is our sound effects artist, Rick Haggerty, our sound engineer, and featuring the Together Again duo. struck jealous criminal commits murder and then sets up a fall guy. Detective stories are not all serious. Take our next one. Tongue in cheek, that is. Dragnet is not merely a radio, television show, nor film. It is an American institution with its characters ever immortalized in popular culture. Like most of today's shows, Dragnet began in the pulps. This time, Detective and Crook Stories, 1929. It was one of the first law enforcement procedural dramas bringing police boredom, danger, and heroics into the homes of Americas, influencing popular opinion of police departments across our country. Producer-actor Jack Webb starred in many old-time radio shows prior to Dragnet, often as a detective or another member of law enforcement. He developed his memorable and distinguished voice cadence and deadpan delivery used in his characterization of Sergeant Joe Friday. The series covered crimes ranging from check fraud, petty theft, and bunco detail to more sensational topics like murder, drug abuse, and taboo topics such as sex crimes and child abduction and murder. With a semi-documentary style, realism would be the show's feature. Webb began hanging out at police headquarters, riding with detective teams on house calls. He attended classes at police academy, becoming fluent in police terminology and technique. The show was applauded for its positive portrayal of police officers so much that upon his death, Jack Webb's Friday's badge number 714 was retired. Today's episode, written by Richard Bell of Salem, Wisconsin, is a spoof on this popular show. And true to its role in pop culture, Rich has included some characters you're sure to recognize. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 10 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case, transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. The story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Los Angeles, the city that never rests but has to stay on its feet or fall into the ocean. I walk these streets and I carry a badge. My name's Friday. I was working the Missing Person Bureau that September afternoon when a call came in. Officer! Oh, you gotta help me, please. Can we talk? I lost my youth. Calm down, madam, and let me get some information. May I have your name, please? Yes, this is Joan Rivers. Madam, <laughs> madam, we can't use real names here. We're trying to protect the innocent. Listen, honey, I haven't been innocent in decades. You got that right, baby. But you simply gotta help me. So, you're calling to report a missing child? Huh, no, I'm calling to report I lost my youth and I can't get it back. Sure. What did this youth look like? Well, she was young and carefree and beautiful. In fact, she was gorgeous. Can you tell me where she was last seen? Last time I saw her was in my mirror. Oh, and she's gone! Ma'am, I'll be right over. I found my partner at the ice cream machine and gave him the scoop. I still wasn't sure about the missing child, but we had to check it out. Joe, it sounds a lot like some of the other calls we've been getting from Hollywood Hills, but it's going to have to wait. We just received an urgent call from the west side of Hollywood. Yeah? What is it? An attack of zombies. Let's roll.
It was about 2 p.m. when we reached Mulholland Drive and the street was impassable. The entire area was covered with the walking dead. We decided to take the shotgun and a shovel and get out of the vehicle. A zombie was approaching us and I wanted to try and communicate to find out what was going on. Okay, that's close enough. Tell me what's going on in here. Let's take one out for questioning. Maybe we can get inside his head, such as it is, and see things from his point of view. How do you propose we do that? We find a straggler, wound him a little, and then drag him into the back of the seat of the squad car and lock the door. But we've got to be quick, Frank. The situation is rapidly getting out of control. Why didn't I think of that? Hey, there's one over there by the soda machine. Let's give him a pop and capture him. He looks kind of familiar, Joe. Isn't that David Letterman? I guess our rule about using real names is out the window. Yeah, you're right. Let's get him. You hit him in the head with the shovel and I'll grab what's left of his legs and throw him in the cruiser. Okay, buddy. We want to know what's going on, and we want to know it now. Uh, good afternoon, Ossifer. Uh, what can I do for you out now? <laughs> we want information regarding your zombie organization, and we want it now, Sonny Jim. My name is David, or at least it was while I was in the land of the living. <laughs> so anyway, here is what you need to know. Our leader is called Dr. Yu. Second in command is Mr. How, and the straw boss is Mr. Man. <laughs> ah. I think I understand, but where do you fit in? You use on the top. How's that? Oh, he's second. <laughs> oh, man. Ah. This is confusing. A you is. I am? No, a you. <laughs> ah. How's that again? Second in command. Who's second? There is no who, only you and how. <laughs> and how is right? Man, this is confusing. Man is not confusing. He's the straw boss. Y you sure? <laughs> you is sure, all right. No, I'm not sure at all. You keep confusing me somehow. You isn't even here, but somehow somewhere else right now. And how... And he... how is right. Man, oh man. What about man? <laughs> I have no idea what I just said or what you were saying. You didn't say anything. <laughs> I just did say something. I don't know how I'm getting tripped up each time. You don't know how, but I do. You know how? <laughs> of course you knows how. There you go again. You isn't going anywhere. Darn right <laughs> I'm not. Man, what a mess. Man is not a mess, but actually quite intact for a zombie. <laughs> how do you know that? Never mind. There do is... you know who is in charge? There is no who. I only know you and how. You don't know me, man. He might if you give him a chance. He's pretty entertaining at zombie parties. <laughs> and I'm not man, I'm David. How's that? How's what? What you just said. You didn't say anything. You isn't even here. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm right here. Man, this is confusing. You said it, brother. Listen, I'm expected at the next demonstration this evening. Can you give me a lift back into town? <laughs> I have a better <laughs> idea for you, man. And how. <laughs> So much, so much for trying to understand the other point of view. But I will say this for you. What's that? You got inside his head. <laughs> yeah, like I said, what's left of it. Let's drive out to Jones' place. There may be more there than meets the eye. And how? We were racing down Sepulveda Avenue when suddenly we found ourselves behind a car going only 20 miles per hour. I had to find out why, so we pulled it over and got out of the car to question the driver. Excuse me, sir. May I have your name, please? Honorable name is Charlie Chan, and I am in hot pursuit of subject. Believe it to be female zombie on bicycle. Mm, eyes not as cold as when I was young. Perhaps you should let your son drive the car. Yeah, Pops, I have my license. Assistant should be seen, not heard. <laughs> Father who depend on son is happy or foolish, depending on son. Nevertheless, you were driving too slowly. You could cause an accident that way. Confucius say, luck, happy chain of foolish accidents. I told you you were driving too slow. Maybe you should let me drive. 
every maybe has a wife called maybe not. <laughs> Can you give me a name and description of this zombie? Name of honorable zombie is Miss Way. Way? Yes, Way. No way. <laughs> Excuse, please. Must get back to hot pursuit of suspect. Users talk like boat without oar. Get no place. <laughs> You're really some kind of walking fortune cookie, aren't you, buddy? All right, then, but be careful and good luck. We finally pulled into the driveway and were met by the maid. She complained about a foul odor coming from the house and then ran off. We got out of the squad car and proceeded to the entrance. After knocking several times and receiving no answer, we entered since the door was already open. Hello? Anyone home? In here, officer! Ma'am, we spoke earlier by phone about your missing youth. Can you give us more information? Never mind about that now. I want to introduce you to my new friends. This is Dr. Yu and Mrs. Howe and Man. They're gonna make me queen of the zombies, so at last I'll have something to be famous for again. Just think of all the no opportunities for me. Oh, 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 oh. Joe, was, uh, was that really necessary? I'm afraid so, Frank. Not only have we destroyed the heads of the zombie organization, but I won't have to listen to you go through that who is you routine again. <laughs> yeah, but, but shooting Joan, she wasn't even a zombie yet. What? Oh. Uh, she wasn't? <clears throat> she sure looked like one to me. Better leave that out of the report uh, for now. Say, I know a great donut shop down the road. Let's stop off there while we write the report and bring a box back for the chief. Sounds good to me. Let's roll. The story you just heard was true. Unfortunately, we were unable to change the names to protect the innocent. You've just heard Dragnet, The Big Youth, written by Richard Bell and directed by Nita Hunter, starring Doug Despin, Gary Stamm, Ed Gajula, Donna Ebert, J.R. Trimark, and John McLaughlin, featuring Candy Helson on sound effects and the Together at Again duo. I'm your announcer, Nate Stamper. <laughs> Coming. I hope you enjoyed it. Where am I off to? I got a great lead on a case. Murder, mystery, and plenty of dames. I'll tell you about it next time. Last one out, please shut off the lights. <laughs> See you later, sweetheart. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out. Have a great day.